conflict coordination. <clears throat> but it's because, as I said to you yesterday, Franz is an expert in GRBs, so I let him give uh, the lecture on the connection between gravitational waves and GRBs, and I'm going to give this lecture on his behalf. Um, so we are going to talk about the instruments. Sis, yes. Just one second. Let me say first in, in, in Portuguese. So I found this here, lá embaixo, o quarto 1703 andar. The quarto de hotel. Alguém está aqui? Mais aqui? 1703 andar. Lá do hotel onde estamos localizados. Okay. So now I'm going to ask in English. So I I found this one. This is the room 1703, seventh floor. So someone lost it. So it must be from <coughs> someone from this meeting. Hmm. Okay. So just in case someone says, hey, I don't have the key to my room, so you know that is with me, okay? Or if you're homeless, that's your opportunity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was him, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So what I'm, go what I'm going to talk uh, to today is about the instruments that make CTA. So not so much the technique, but the, the actual instrumentation. <clears throat> so, of course, I'm going to say something about the imaging atmospheric terrain of uh, technique and the, and the nature of these instruments, which you have heard a lot about. And then I'm going to go specifically into CTA, which has many telescope types to make our life um, as complicated as possible. And I'm going to try to talk about the essential aspects of all of them, mostly optics, mechanics, not electronics, although electronics is also an important part of CTA for the cameras. I'm going to just to give the general um, characteristics of, of these electronics that allow us to do the observations that we need. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about the only instrument of CTA that is already on the final site and uh, is operating scientifically, which is the LST-1 prototype. So this instrument, although it's a prototype, it's not going to be replaced or scrapped. It's going to just be corrected if there is anything to correct and continue there. It's a large telescope uh, and very expensive. This, this, the large telescopes of CTA cost around 10 million euros each, so you cannot make a prototype that you throw away. And uh, you cannot transport easily as well this prototype after build, so you have this one you have to build, the, 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 the first instrument on the site that you're going to operate. And this is the one that Vitor said that we in Rio um, uh, worked for the preparation of the, the actuator plates, uh, which maintain the 200 mirror facets aligned for the observations. <coughs> um, and then, if uh, there is time, and uh, Farinaldo is going to tell me when to stop, uh, I'm going to talk about IACTs and uh, extensive air shower arrays, which are the tanks that we have seen, so the complementarity between these two techniques and then I would uh, focus a little bit in the end in SW Joe, which is the project that Vitor mentioned and of which I'm uh, uh, one of the international coordinators. So um, you have heard a lot about it, but just uh, to recap, <coughs> the imaging atmospheric terrain of technique uh, uses uh, an indirect uh, mean to observe the gamma ray by observing the particle cascades, actually the the rank of lightitude of the particle cascades that develop in the atmosphere after the penetration of the gamma ray or the cosmic ray, whatever. Um, so the, the atmosphere serves as a calorimeter. The terrain of view of the, of the shower is proportional to the, energy, to the energy of the incoming particle. And by simulation, you can establish under very specific conditions if you know the model of your atmosphere, if you know the direction which, from where you are, the, the gamma ray is coming from, you can reconstruct the energy of the gamma. You can create tables or you can create clever uh, computational tools to uh, transform the energy observed in a rank of light into the energy that the gamma ray deposited in the top of the atmosphere. Um, so it is based on the indirect detection of this blue light. Uh, the main characteristic of this blue light is that it's very short. It's a pulse of light that lasts for nanoseconds. So we always see the showers drawn like this, which is actually uh, uh, the picture of the whole development of the showering time. So the shower is not a, a continuous thing. It's a front of particles that go interacting with the atmosphere and multiplying. So it's a front that's very narrow 
of the order of uh, 10 meters uh, compared to 10 kilometers of extension of the shower or so, and uh, where particles and photons propagate with a very uh, similar speed. In fact, the particles are going faster. And that's why the shower front is so narrow. Because as soon as a particle induces the production of a Cherenkov photon, it's not the particle that emits the Cherenkov photon. If you go into Feynman's uh, lecture on physics, there is a very nice chapter on Cherenkov radiation, which explains this very well. Uh, it's actually the um, uh, depolarization of the atmosphere after the passage of a, a charged particle, the coherent depolarization of the atmosphere after the passage of the uh, relativistic particle and superluminal particle uh, in, in the air that uh, produces the Cherenkov light. So it's the atmosphere itself that is giving off the Cherenkov light. So the, the, the particle is, is, is um, losing energy by other processes, but not by production of, uh, of Cherenkov light. So it induces the production of this Cherenkov light, and it uh, goes uh, it, uh, it surpasses the photons that the atmosphere produces. So it's always ahead, the particles are always ahead. That's when you see the image, you are seeing the image being reconstructed backwards in time. I think someone said, I think Franz said that already in a, in a lecture. But the shower front, because the difference cannot be so large of the, of, of the velocities, is very, very narrow. So the trick is that uh, you have to create a camera that is uh, very fast, to take a picture within uh, 10 nanoseconds or a few tens of nanoseconds, and uh, so that you can have a clear image of the shower, because if you integrate for too long, the night sky background is stronger than the chunk of light. But if you integrate in that small window of the shower front, then the shower front is much stronger and you can see it. So that's, that's the reason why we don't see the chunk of light, simply because we integrate uh, 0.1 second or something like this. And, uh, and this, of course, is overwhelming. The background is overwhelming against the shrink of light. But this, this is being emitted all the time. <coughs> Another important thing is that the light is being emitted with a very narrow angle, which is proportional to the density to, to where you are in the atmosphere. And uh, so the shower, uh, the shrink of angle is uh, narrower, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 degrees in the top of the atmosphere. And as you go down, it, it increases a little bit to 1 degree, 1.2 degrees. And that's what generates that focusing effect that you have heard about as well in a previous lecture. And uh, so you have uh, an e all these emissions happen, therefore, in a cone. And the composition of these emissions form a light pool, which is circular. If you are looking a shower coming right from the zenith on top of you, or is, is this rain? Wow. Or it's uh, an, an ellipse if uh, you are seeing the shower coming from a side, right? So the, the, it's just the kind of lateral projection of the shower. What are the strengths of this technique? The biggest strength of the Cherenkov technique is the fact that uh, one single Cherenkov telescope, even if it only has 100 square meters, which is already a lot, of um, mirror area, it has 10 to the 5 square meters of effective area. Why? because the size of the pool is 10 to the 5 square meters in the ground, on the ground. So all the showers that can give off a light pool that touches your telescope, which have then a distribution of 10 to the 5 uh, square meters around the telescope, give a signal. So one single telescope has a huge effective area. And that's what allows us to observe um, gamma rays at very high energies, even if the fluxes are so low. So why do we put many telescopes? The only reason why we put many telescopes under the same uh, light pool, so f distant 100 meters or something like this from each other, depending on the energy, this can change, uh, is so that you have uh, multiple images of the same shower, and you can do stereoscopy. Uh, it's like a 3D reconstruction of the direction, but you can also improve your sensitivity, your calorimetry, because you have many measurements of the same event. So this is the only reason. Um, so because of the large effective area, it achieves a very low energy threshold. These showers really develop for a sizable mm, length in the atmosphere, starting from 5 GeV. You wouldn't have uh, a, 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 an important shower with uh, photons of less energy than that. And we can detect photons up to 20 GeV. So we go almost close to the limit that we can do, so very low energy threshold. 
and uh, you can get a uh, rather good uh, angular resolution of few arc minutes and an energy resolution which is also respectable of around 10%. The energy resolution is limited by the stochasticity of the shower. So each shower develops in a different way because it's a completely stochastic process and you have uh, large errors associated to, it, to each individual measurement. <coughs> so these are strengths, but there are also limitations. The main limitation is the duty cycle. You can only use these telescopes for 1,500 hours a year, which is about 15% of the available time in a year. The reason is the cameras, they are not only fast, they are extremely sensitive. And if you point these photomultiplier tubes uh, close to the moon and you don't even need the full moon, you burn them. Um, that's because you operate then in high gain, you operate then uh, with a uh, uh, high voltage so that you can really transform the um, weak terrain of signal in a sizable uh, electric current that you then measure. So because of this, you can only operate in dark nights or today some, um, um, you can still operate if the moon is not full and is far away angularly from you, so you're seeing the other side. But this is still increasing systematics anyway. So which means that, um, yes, there is a, a big limitation to how much science you can do over a year, especially because these sources have low fluxes. So you need integration times that are not like astronomy, optical astronomy, that uh, with a couple of minutes you, you get a source. Here you need hours and hours, typically. So how uh, is the scene, the current scene of uh, ground-based gamma astronomy? I think I showed that to you again. So just to highlight the, the three operating ISTs, HES is the only one in the southern hemisphere. You have MAGIC in the Canary Islands, in the same place where CTA is going to be installed, and you have Veritas uh, in New Mexico. And then you have uh, the two operating um, uh, uh, um, water terrain of arrays, HAWK and LASSO, and uh, the SWGO, which we are planning in, in the Andes. And CTA is going to have these two sites that uh, we have already talked about. <coughs> so. The first plot to characterize uh, any instrument is the effective area, which is basically the convolution between uh, the, the um, geometric area of the instrument and the acceptance of the signal. So you can see here, for example, for Fermi, that the effective area, uh, the maximum effective area, is uh, in this range between 10 to the 4 MeV and 10 to the 6 MeV, more or less, and it's around one square meter compared to something like a CTA, which has an effective area that uh, grows steadily from uh, tens of uh, GV all the way up to hundreds of TVs with uh, an effective area of 10 to the 7 square meters. That's because CTA is not one telescope. CTA is an array of telescopes that's going to, in the southern hemisphere, occupy a region of 10 square kilometers. So that's the, the, the detection area that you have. So it's quite impressive, this difference. Uh, it is a factor of 10 to the 7, which means that uh, you have 10 to the 7 more photons for the same observation done with Fermilat and, uh, and CTA. And uh, this is the plot that shows for all the instruments of the field of gamma ray astronomy currently in operation or planned. You have seen that many times, but let's look at that again. Uh, which shows the sensitivity. So the lower you are here, the best. So this is the limiting sensitivity you can observe. So if you point to a region of the sky, what this curves means is that if, if you point to a region of the sky for 50 hours, which is the calculation done for CTA, in each of these energy beams, if there is a source with a flux of, uh, I don't know, 2 times 10 to the minus 13 eggs per centimeter square, you're going to detect it. Right? So this, that's the meaning of, uh, of sensitivity. If it's below, you're not going to detect. If it's above, you're going to detect in less time. <coughs> and uh, usually, we measure this in, in 50 hours because it's a typical observation time, historically speaking, of, of uh, gamma ray sources. So you can spend 50 hours observing an interesting source. So we use that as, as a reference. Of course, the galactic center, you're going to observe for 500 hours. But that's not typical, right? And, uh, and of course, if you change the time, these curves are going to go up and down. You can see here that you have uh, two curves for CTA. You have uh, a curve for the CTA Southern Array, which is more sensitive than the one for the CTA Northern Array, especially uh, in, the, uh, in the middle to high energy range. 
And that's because they are going to have different number and different types of instruments, and we are going to discuss this a little bit. And uh, here you can see the curves of Fermi. So Fermi, um, when we arrive at this range of tens of uh, GV, which was a window that was opened by Fermi, nevertheless, the uh, sensitivity degrades uh, monotonically and, ve and very rapidly. So that CTA around 100 GV uh, greatly dominates already the sensitivities uh, of, uh, of uh, observations. Um, he and here you can see uh, Hawk, which is an older instrument, uh, integration time of five years, and Lasso, which is the future, is the new, it was built two years ago already, uh, extens extensive air shower array of the Chinese uh, with an integration time of one year. So it's much better already than, than Hawks, much larger, of course. And you can see that uh, Lasso uh, and all these kinds of instruments, here you see the prospects for SWGO, are bound to dominate the astronomy that we do above uh, several tenths of uh, TV. So these, these are complementary. Why do we use, again, that, that I think was said by Franz, why do we say, quote, things here in years? Because these are instruments that you cannot point. They're simply collecting. They are transit instruments. So the sky goes above. They have a 1, 1 1.5 square radian field, field of view, which is about 60 degrees in diameter in the sky. And everything that passes on top uh, gives a signal, and you continuously integrate the sky. So every day you integrate all the regions that are visible to you, and so you are going to get um, ever better and better significance. Of course, uh, the, the increasing sensitivity goes with the square root of time, so it takes, it's, a, it's a bit a slow curve, uh, but the sensitivity always improves. And uh, this, these two things is just to tell you that uh, the intensity of, so to compose this, you have to do two things. Uh, you have to be able to measure the photon energy, of course. You have to be identify in each beam uh, how many photons you are, you are getting. And this you get from the intensity of the Cherenkov image. And uh, you need also to do the, that which is the greatest challenge of gamma astronomy, which is background rejection. And that was already explained to you. That is done by a parameterization of the shower image uh, as conceived by Hilas and then developed by the community over uh, many decades. So this is so important that uh, the first Cherenkov uh, shower that was detected was in the 50s, 60s. But the first source that was detected was in 89, five years after the development of the Hillis parameters. So there is a direct correlation from the capability of separating the background, which, is, which can be, depending on the energy, 10,000 times more numerous than the signal that you want to see, uh, and the detection of the Crab Nebula, the first source. Um, photon direction is also important for sensitivity, so how good your resolution is. I'm going to show this uh, better later. Um, but of course, it's, a, it's an important parameter for us to uh, do astronomy. And you can see here that, again, Cherenkov telescopes are the gamma ray instruments with by far the best resolution. So if you want to, do, uh, to study the morphology of the sources in detail, you should go to these instruments at, at high energies. The satellites cannot do it so well. They have uh, limitations on size. And, uh, and, and instead, for the high energies, uh, the f for, for the Cherenkov telescopes, um, the angular resolution increases steadily. This is simply because the images become brighter and sharper and better defined. And so it's always easier and easier to define the direction where they are from. And they degrade a lot because the low energy, towards low energies, because the low energy showers, they have is, 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 is small uh, images with little light, so you cannot uh, parameterize and identify uh, the shape, the geometry of this, this, this light so well. <coughs> um, and uh, you can see here as well that uh, the instruments like SWGO, LASSO is not shown, uh, for the core, which is a more dense region of the detector, have uh, a much worse an, uh, angular resolution than um, Cherenkov instruments, and you cannot go around that, but it improves fairly well towards the most extreme energy. So for the most extreme energies, it's, you can reach something like 0.1 degree, which is good enough, and here you are around uh, a few work minutes with CTA. <coughs> and this is perhaps a plot that uh, shows the power of uh, Cherenkov telescopes like no other. So we showed these curves. 
that give a, a perspective of uh, how CTA and how the sensitivity of CTA and Fermi compare. But this is, you are comparing 50 hours integration of CTA, so probably a steady source, yes, makes sense to, to, to say this, and uh, a curve of 10 years for Fermilat. And you can see that, well, yes, uh, in 100 GV, CTA and Fermilat, 10 years, 50 hours are equivalent. But because CTA has such an, a large effective area, 10 to the 7 times larger than Fermi, when you go to the low integration times and you compare the same integration times, that becomes... Uh, you see, CTA is uh, 100 times, in the very short time scale, more sensitive than Fermi. So when you see a GRB with, uh, with, um, with CTA or with a Cherenkov telescope, you see an incredibly large number, lar larger number of photons than you would uh, see with any satellite. And, and this is very powerful because then you can do light curves with uh, extreme precision at the seconds uh, time scales. You can do re can reconstruct the spectra very, very well. So it's, it's really an advantage for transients. So CTA and the IACTs are really prime uh, transient observatories. Of course, they have to point to the source. They have to get a trigger and point to the source because they're not serving instruments. So there's this, this disadvantage. But once you are there, it's fantastic. So as I already showed this part of this um, slides for you in the first lecture, that uh, gamma ray astronomy for all the reasons, Cherenkov astronomy for all the reasons that I mentioned, is, uh, uh, has reached the real astronomy status. But what was the recipe, the instrumental recipe for success? First of all, the efficient gamma hadron separation and the stereoscopy. So this gave angular resolution, they gave us background separation capability, and it was extremely important. Uh, was the essential thing, the two things that, uh, that defined the field. Um, the other thing is that we have a large light collection area, so the mirror areas are above 100 square meters, and uh, this allows you to collect enough uh, chirink of light, even if you're observing only a small part of the 100,000 square meters uh, sh shower light pool. Uh, the very sensitive cameras with very small pixels that allow you to really construct and, and, uh, and then model the shape of the, the shower image. If the pixels were too large, you wouldn't get a good uh, glimpse of, of that. And uh, the large field of view of several degrees that allows us to make images of these uh, extended sources. They, mostly in the galaxy, they are all extended sources. So you do need that to be able to do galactic astronomy. So, CTA, let me see just how the time is going. <coughs> okay. Mm. For, uh, so, this is the infrastructure of CTA, as you have already heard. So, CTA is going to have two sites. Uh, and uh, it has had for, for some time uh, uh, an office in Heidelberg, and in the future, when it's consolidated as an ERIC, it's going to have two offices, one in Bologna for the administration of the observatory, and the data center is going to be in Desi near, near Berlin. <coughs> um, there are also two large structures that are dialoguing with CTA. One is the CTA observatory, which Vitor called the CTAO uh, during his, his talk. Uh, which is responsible for the building and operations of CTA. So it's the company, the ERIC, that's going to build and operate the instruments. And the CTA consortium, of which Vitor is the chair, uh, is, was responsible historically, first for having the idea, for having the concept and developing the concept of CTA, and then designing the telescope. So it was all the intellectual work that uh, was used to, to realize CTA. Uh, it provides in-kind contributions. It can be in the form of scientists. It can be in the form of uh, technological development and instrumentation that is created for CTA. <coughs> and uh, as a reward for that, after CTA, the observatory is built, uh, it's going to have some uh, special access to, to, to time in the observatory to do those uh, large, what we could say, legacy science cases of CTA. So the things that uh, you could not easily do as an open observatory because you need uh, thousands of hours of observation and uh, it's very difficult to grant openly to the community and it's very complex or you want to do a, the, the catalog of the sky, the survey of the, the galactic plane. 
So all these things will be done by, by the consortium, and then we'll go to the community that then is going to do more in-depth science starting from that. So in the beginning, there was only the CTA consortium with its science activities and uh, the R&D of instrumentation. So the logical, so this is a timeline, but it's a logical timeline. Uh, it started with a science vision and instrument concept. So Vitor has put some uh, dates on this when he gave his talk. Then there was the design phase where you have the concept, you have the science, and then you figure out what kind of instruments and with what characteristics you need to do the science that, um, that you envisaged. Then uh, you go to something which is called the pre-construction phase where you plan all the construction, you develop prototype of uh, separate units, you test them uh, so that you are then prepared to move on to real prototype in an integration of the various technological elements that compose the observatory. And that uh, this leads to construction phase, which is where we are getting to very close now. We need the ERIC because without this law, all the money that's already secured for CTA cannot be used, cannot really flow. So once the ERIC is founded, we can start construction. This is going to take some years. And then we go into an operation phase where for the beginning, the consortium is going to be a big protagonist. Also because for the first years, you'll be adding more telescopes. So you need people to test, to see how the instrument is developing, to commission the, the telescopes until we get a stable uh, instrument with stable data properties that we can safely release to the community. And uh, of course, with all experiments that last for several decades, which is the case of CTA, you are going to go through upgrades and etc. Uh, the important thing about CTA is that it's going to be the first open observatory. So until today, if you wanted to do observations with a Cherenkov telescope, you had to uh, be part of a collaboration. You could not access this data. This is not because uh, people were mean and uh, wanted to keep things for themselves. There are two reasons. The first reason is, of course, the, the, these things are, were built and run as experiments. And so they were funded in a certain way in which the usage as, as, a, as a kind of uh, collaboration facility was more natural. And the other reason is that uh, these instruments, because they were not observatories, HES is not an observatory, it's an experiment, you were understanding many aspects of the technique. So you were developing the way you do analysis. You were understanding how to better operate these instruments until they reach the maturity that allows you to build something like CTA. So it would be very difficult. Now we have tools and we can do that, and we are starting to do that. It would be very difficult to give uh, data to the community from the magic telescopes 10 years ago. They would not be able to do any science with it. Because unless you know the instrument, every bit and bolt that you put in that instrument, you could not reduce the data properly. So now things are mature, and you can create gen general tools that anyone, even the people that never worked with the building of the instrument, can understand and produce good results. So that's, that's basically the main reason. Uh, so there's going to be a regular uh, announcements of opportunities for, for, for observations, so you can propose your science case and get data and analyze. You're going to get uh, proprietary time to do your analysis before it becomes public for everybody, probably one year. And, uh, and there is going to be, uh, so you're going to receive not the data in the raw format, but calibrated photon lists like Fermi. So it's very simple to use. And, uh, and then, of course, all this data is going to become a legacy that you can use as, as a, as a rep repository data. You go there and you reanalyze as many times as you want to do new science. Um, CTA is going to have an alpha configuration. Uh, so when it's built, it's not going to have the size and the number of telescopes that was first envisaged. This is due to budget restrictions. But it's going to have a, a kind of initial configuration that then money, money allowing in the future is going to be expanded to the final. But it's still, it's going to be by far the best instrument in the field. Uh, so the science is guaranteed. And here you have the, the drawing that shows the, the um, arrangement of the array with the two telescopes that are initially going to compose the northern array, so LSTs, these four in the middle, and these blue ones, which are the MSTs. So you have no small telescopes in the northern hemisphere because you don't care so much about the high energies. And uh, here you have the two magic telescopes. So CTA is going to be built on the site of the magic uh, observatory. Yeah. <clears throat> and here you have the southern hemisphere in a completely new site. 
with, uh, in the future, potentially, uh, four large telescopes, and then you have uh, a number of medium-sized telescopes, and then, yes, you have lots of small telescopes around, because in the south, you want to see the galaxy in extreme energy, so you need these instruments. This is about uh, one square kilometer in area, uh, or a little bit more, and this is about uh, 10 square kilometers in area, or a, a little bit less. So the instruments for to observe the low energies uh, are the large telescopes. Why the large telescopes observe the low energies? Because the limitation for the observation in the low energies is the amount of Cherenkov light that uh, a photon produces. So you need a very large mirror area to be able to collect as much Cherenkov light as you can to make a good image of the shower and, and detect the, the gammas. Um, so you need large telescopes. Could you make CTA only out of large telescopes? Yes, you could. It would, be, would probably have better sensitivity, but it's not, not cost effective. As I said, this, each of these telescopes are around the 10 million euros, whereas these small ones are 500,000 euros, more or less. So there's a big difference. If you can optimize with these small ones, it's a, it's a good thing. And uh, so the energy threshold can get to 20 GeV. The, the telescope is, is just uh, huge. It has 23 meters in diameter. And you are going to only put four in the center in the north and, and four in the center in the south. Uh, so they're going to see together in, in the stereoscopy the large, uh, the, the low energy showers. The medium energies uh, are going to be observed so from 100 GV to 10 TV, mostly by the medium sized telescopes, which are the drivers of CTA. So that's the, the, the kind of sweet spot, the best sensitivity of CTAs in this range. They have 11.5 meters in diameter. And you are going to have initially 14 uh, medium-sized telescopes in the south and nine in the north. And then you have the low energies only uh, in the north, uh, only in the south. Sorry, 37 small-sized telescopes uh, scattered in a large area of 10 kilometers square, um, and uh, each of them has uh, 4.3 meters in diameter. So even the small telescope is, is large enough. And this so it's, is how it's going to look like. So it's basically a superposition of subarrays, a central subarray of uh, large telescopes, a middle-range subarray of middle telescopes, and, uh, and uh, then a large subarray of small telescopes. But they're going to work together. So if a shower illuminates this portion of, uh, of the array, it's going to be detected by both, and it's going to be analyzed by both. And uh, so here you can see how these three instruments, so wh why do we need these three types of instruments? <coughs> to be able to cover a large energy area, uh, a large energy range. And this is how you get that. So each of these subarrays uh, has a different effective area curve, which when you sum up, you get that curve that you, that you saw in the beginning of the, the talk. And again, with these instruments together, you can do all the science that we have been discussing with the emphasis uh, in these boxes uh, here. Okay, so let's go into some more details in this room. How, many, how much time do I have, Farinaldo? Most, 10, okay. <coughs> so, um, the optics of these telescopes. Uh, so, the first Cherenkov detection was made with a dust bin, metal dust bin, where the people, put, where the guys, the British, uh, Gale Bright and Jelly, put a mirror at the bottom of the dustbin, and a PMT on the top. And they were able to detect um, Cherenkov light in a very cheap way. Um, so the telescopes evolved a lot uh, in time. <coughs> and uh, the technology that first characterized the design, the mechanical, the optical design of these instruments, was inherited from early solar concentrators. So not from a typical kind of telescope design, but for, for uh, things used for, for solar, focusing solar energy. So this is called the Davis Cotton design, optical design. And uh, so here, what you have is that your reflective surface is a section of, uh, of, uh, of a spherical, of a sphere. And uh, it is composed by various uh, facets, because you cannot build a mirror that is so large, so you have to build it. Uh, in facets that then you control and you align, uh, each of them being a, a spherical mirror of uh, double the uh, radius of curvature. 
So this gives one very interesting thing to gamma ray astronomy observations, which is the fact that allows you, you also use these observations a bit out of focus, so that you enlarge a little bit the image of the shower. And by enlarging a little bit the image, defocusing in a controlled way the image of the shower in the camera plane, you can get a better reconstruction of the geometry. So you're not interested in seeing, uh, in focusing all the, sh the light of the terrain of uh, shower in one point, but you want to reconstruct the elliptical image to do gamma hadron separation. So this design allows you to concentrate a lot of light uh, and also to play this trick where you can uh, optimize your defocusing to get, uh, get the best reconstruction. So, so in fact, you're not looking for precision uh, optics in the sense of uh, the, 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 the best mirror quality, the best uh, spot size. You are looking for something a little bit different when you do gamma ray astronomy. And uh, the other important thing uh, is that, uh, so th the main characteristics of the shower front is that it's uh, very narrow, so a few nanoseconds. So the, the shower front is going to get to your telescope, it's going to be reflected, and it's going to go back to the camera. And uh, you are going to see the, the Cherenkov photons in the camera. So you have to guarantee that when you have this reflection in the mirrors, you don't mess with the timing of the shower front. So if you introduce a lot of delays, relative delays between the light that is reflected in the center of the, the reflective area and in the corners, you might spread your shower too much and lose the advantage that you have of the low uh, time integration. And then this is, 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 is bad for, for, for the observation of the shower. These telescopes, although they're good light concentrators, they are not synchronous. But uh, for the sizes that they have been applied until 10 to 15 meters in diameter, this delay is only of a few nanoseconds. So you distort a little bit the timing of the shower front, but only within this 10 nanoseconds window of the size of the shower front, let's say. And, uh, and so this is not a problem. When you go to larger telescopes, like the large size telescope, this Davis Cotton design cannot be used anymore. Because then for 25 meters diameter, the time delays between the reflection in the center and in the, and in the edge of the, of the reflective surface are large and they are going to severely uh, hamper your, your image. So that's why MAGIC, for example, uses a parabolic um, dish, which is isochronous by definition. So <coughs> you have small off-axis aberrations. Uh, but this is not a problem, and uh, the whole design provides a good compromise uh, so that you can have a good PSF over the entire and very large field of view. So the other characteristic about these instruments is that uh, you have a very large field of view with this composition of uh, the faceted um, uh, um, spherical mirrors over a, 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 a spherical shape of different uh, radius of curvature. So you can get uh, several degrees of field of view. So as I said, uh, for magic, you can see a close-up here of, the, of the, the mirrors, and you can see here a picture of magic which has 23 meters in diameter, sorry, 17 meters in diameter. Um, um, the Davis Cotton design would not work, so you use a parabolic uh, uh, dish and mirror segments. Then you guarantee your isochronicity. Uh, you still have some uh, small on-axis aberrations, but you can uh, reconstruct a better on-axis angular resolution. The price you pay for the parabolic design is that you have very large off-axis aberrations. But since magic is in the northern hemisphere and it's not imaging the galactic plane, uh, and therefore is not doing precise uh, morphology of extended sources, so not using the whole camera as has is, is using all the time, this is also okay. It's acceptable for the kind of science that it's doing. And it's going to be the same thing with CTA. The large telescopes are going to be going to have larger aberration, but uh, in, in the edges, but they typically are not doing uh, morphology with the extragalactic sources. So this is a picture of the medium-sized telescope, the prototype that Vitor mentioned. Uh, you cannot see here very well the structure that he, he mentioned, but uh, you can see here the picture of the huge camera which he describes with 
five tons uh, that sits on the top of this uh, mechanical structure that was was developed by him and and, and the and the company uh, in San Jose. <coughs> so this this is a Dave Scotton design. It has a medium-sized telescope. It's a Dave Scotton Dave uh, Scotton design. So you can see here that uh, the focus of the instrument is here, but you put the camera here so that you defocus a little bit to enlarge the image and you can reconstruct better the, the shower. So this is a problem. Uh, this was a video of uh, showing how this, this camera uh, of the medium-sized telescope called Flashcam was seeing showers, but in the PDF it doesn't appear and I, I forgot about that. So you can, uh, I guess you can find that somewhere or I can put uh, the PPT as well for for you later so that you can see the showers forming. Um, what I just wanted to show is here the camera with all the pixels is 1,800 pixels, which means 1,800 photomultiplier tubes. I think each photomultiplier tube usually costs something like a thousand to two thousand dollars each without electronics. So it's an expensive thing to build one of these. And uh, it has a huge field of view, thanks to, thanks to the Dave Scotton design of 80 degrees. And uh, it has a, 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 a plate scale of 0.17 degrees per pixel. So each of these pixels cover 0.17 degrees in the sky, which provides you a very sharp image of the showers. And uh, this is perhaps one of the most innovati innovative designs that uh, was developed uh, along the course of CTA, is the first dual mirror uh, te a of telescope. So you have a primary reflector, a secondary reflector, and then you put the camera here to, to detect the, the, the shower. Uh, the this is a kind of alternative medium-sized telescope design, which is probably going to be added to CTA in the future, as uh, such a CTA upgrade is not part of the first uh, configuration of CTA. But the small telescopes that Elizabeth talked about in the first day, that's why I, I'm talking about these and not the ones that she mentioned, follow the same design. In fact, they, they uh, uh, looked into this as well for, for, for the small instruments, because of the, the survey capability that they wanted to achieve. So here you have uh, a, a Schwarzschild Coudé design. And uh, so again, it's the first time that this was made. You can see here a, a person close to the telescopes. You have a primary mirror of 9.7 meters and a secondary, secondary mirror of 5.4 meters. They are always segmented because you cannot meet, make such a mirror like this. Uh, the primary mirror is not spherical, but aspherical, which is a spherical mirror where the radi radius of curvature changes a little bit as you go to the center. This is to correct aberration, so you can correct a little bit of the aberration. And uh, they are, uh, in fact, two aspherical aplanar mirrors. So, so two, the two mirrors have this characteristic that uh, the radius of curvature changes with distance from the center to correct a spherical aberration. But then, each of these mirrors, uh, they don't have the same uh, uh, radius of curvature. And with this, you do that in such a way that you can correct uh, some of the comma that uh, you also get as an aberration of this spherical mirror reflection. So, it's a very sophisticated design. It's also uh, one of the characteristics of this uh, double uh, um, optical design of two mirrors is that the second mirror, it, is, it demagnifies the image. So the first one magnifies the image, the second one concentrates it uh, with uh, good, uh, maintaining a good plate scale, good resolution. And the reason for that is so that you can have a smaller camera, not with less pixels, but smaller in size. And so it's lighter, and if the camera is lighter, uh, all the structure of the telescope that's going to hold it is also lighter. So um, this, is, this is an important part of, uh, of the design. So I don't have to talk about this. Um, so the fact that you use two uh, mirrors uh, means that you have uh, a very wide uh, field of view. And uh, the, this demagnifying effect of the second mirror allows you to have a small focal plane. So uh, each pixel of the camera covers 0.067 degree. 
And what you do to exploit this is to use not PMTs, but small silicon photomultipliers, so you can have a very, very fine pixelation of the image, excellent quality in a compact camera. Um, great, so you have a, an excellent image shape that allows you for background uh, rejection. And this is just a picture of the mirrors and how they, they tile up. Uh, so you have uh, 72 uh, uh, panels, like those uh, interface plates that you saw from the LSTs, to control and, and align these mirrors according to, to your needs. I think, and here you can see a comparison, for example. of uh, the, So this is the image of, uh, of uh, the Davis Cotton medium-sized telescope and the Schwarzschild Kudé medium-sized telescope. So you can see that the image here is very, very sharp. You can see the pixelation. And this is excellent. So uh, I, I don't have to explain. You can see how you can uh, identify the geometry and fit the geometry of this image much better here. So it's going to improve a lot the sensitivity of CTA. Good. I think I blew my time, which was already blown when I started. And uh, I have to close. Just to say why the angular resolution improves the sensitivity as well. Because you can get rid of the hadronic showers. But as you heard in one of the first lectures, you can never get rid of the electron-induced showers in the atmosphere, because they are just electromagnetic showers. So the only way you cut off the electrons is by having the best spot size in this, uh, in this plot of the reconstruction of the position of the shower so that you can uh, put a cut here and uh, have a comparison, uh, have a high sensitivity in the comparison between the signal and the, and the, the background that remained after background separation. So you can see here that this is all this background that uh, evolves after. So this is the region of the source, and that's why you have a high signal. That's the Crab Nebula. But this region is basically showers that are pointing everywhere, not to the direction of the source. And this is composed of a gamma and electron showers that you can use. So the best the angular resolution, the best the sensitivity as well. Good. Stop. Questions? Why are the pixels of the SCT camera uh, square? Why for the other telescopes who have uh, hexagonal pixels? Um, your thing here? Yeah, in, th in this in this picture. <coughs> it has Do, to do make with, uh, with the photo the, with the photo sensor that we use. So the silicon PM square. And, uh, and uh, the, the PMT you put on the top of it, a kind of hexagonal uh, light concentrator called Western Cone, mm -hmm. so that you can get a little bit more light. And also, if you avoid that lights going to fall on the edges of the, 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 mm -hmm. the PMTs. So you have, uh, so this is the PMT. And if you would have another PMT, because they are a bit like this, so you have some space between them. But then if you build some, uh, a light concentrator like this, you guarantee that in the plane of the camera, you have a continuous coverage and you lose no light. Mm -hmm. And this is a reflective surface that takes all the light to the, to the PMT. So this is ex typically hexagonal, hexagonal. For con by construction. And so that's why you have this, this tiling like that. Mm -hmm. it's, um, Thanks. Further questions? Thank you for the lecture. Um, my question is, uh, the image is on some kind of ellipse, don't you? It's, it has a form of an ellipse. So my question is, what, which information give us the major axis of the, of the ellipse at, at the moment of the capture? The, the major axis of the ellipse gives you the direction uh, where the shower is coming from. So when you reconstruct, so the shower is coming from, is somewhere, the, the point where the shower crossed the, the, the ground, the center of the shower crossed the ground, sits on this line of the major axis of the ellipse. Mm. Right. That's, okay. that's the information. So you, it gives the direction of, uh, of the, uh, the shower. 
as concrete. And the eccentricity of the lips give us other kind of information? The, what's uh, the eccentricity of the lips going to tell you how far or how close the shower has hit the ground with respect to the center of the camera? So if, uh, the if you're pointing to the sky and the shower hits directly over the camera, you have a circle, right? Because the light pulls a circle. The more you walk to the side, the more the ellipse becomes elongated, and the more the ellipse goes uh, away from the center of the camera. So there are these two things. This, the ellipse is like, a, the, the image is like a, a, a comet. So if you are observing uh, right on zenith, it's circular. And then if you start to observe from the side, this image gets more and more elliptical, and it starts to drift away from the camera. And to, the po to a point where you cannot observe anymore, because you start to lose, it, to lose part of the shower at the edge of the camera, and you cannot do energy reconstruction anymore. Thank you very much. And that's what gives you the, the viewing, the, the effective area of the telescope. Further questions? No? So let's thank the speaker again.